Um, okay. So, um, all right. So, good morning, all. And um, uh, as we resume our journey through the Jewish year, the, uh, even though we were uh, on break over the summer, the Jewish year continued to go by. And I wanted to uh, today uh, discuss, uh, so our discussion of the Jewish year isn't just about the holidays that come and go, but also other Jewish concepts that, that, uh, that we encounter uh, along the way, whether they are related to Shabbat or holidays or other issues that are that just arise, and I uh, next next Monday is uh, no, it's not Labor Day because <laughs> that would mean it's Rosh Hashanah next Monday night. So we have two two more weeks. So next Monday we'll start talking about the high holiday season and getting ready for that. Today I I wanted to spend a little bit more quality time than what I did not this past Shabbat but the week before. Uh, about my response to Zooming on Shabbat. And it was kind of a, uh, a visceral reaction um, uh, how I presented it in shul on Shabbat. And I didn't treat the topic fairly enough. And I really want to spend uh, some time today doing that. Um, so I, I downloaded and printed the teshuva, the legal document, which is... 50 pages long. It actually is available on the Rabbinical Assembly website. Um, you know, there's a non-member version of the website and there's a member edition of the version of the website. So obviously as a member of the Rabbinical Assembly, I have um, uh, greater access to it, but I'm almost positive that anybody who accesses the Rabbinical Assembly website has access to the decisions of the conservative movement law committee. So you want to look for one that was published um, uh, in July or early August, uh, just recently by Rabbi Joshua Heller. It's 50 pages. So uh, it's up to you if you want to, uh, to access that or not. They, these decisions are uh, complex. And Joshua Heller, I got to give him a lot of credit for providing a lot, a lot of background information on this so that this is really an all-encompassing, all-inclusive kind of teshuva that isn't just narrow in focus, but very broad to cover a lot of issues in it. And I, I want to spend time going through it, but I want to provide some background. So uh, when, we, when we talk about a teshuva, a legal decision, a halachic decision um, uh, about Zooming on Shabbat, where there's still a couple of things that we have to step back from it to understand why there is even such a thing as a teshuva. And even step back from that, that why there is a system of halacha and even a step further behind that is an understanding of the Torah itself. Okay, so I've talked about this and aspects of this over the years, but I, I, let me allow me to, to go through this again. So uh, Judaism exists as we know it for the past 2000 years. The Jewish people as a people have existed for 4000 years. So there is a difference of what happened, what Jews were doing for the first 2,000 years, and what Jews have been doing for the past 2,000 years, okay? <clears throat> so for the first 2,000 years, the Torah describes that Israelites, <clears throat> and I'm going to distinguish between Israelites and Jews, <clears throat> we were Israelites for 2,000 years, and we've been Jews for the past 2,000 years. And it's an important distinction, all based on the temple in Jerusalem. And even before that, on the Mishkan, the portable sanctuary. So Israelites have a relationship with God. 
the one and only God, as we understand God to be, uh, defined by our worship and bringing sacrifices as the form of worship. So the Torah describes holidays to be observed, other sacred occasions, including Shabbat to be observed. And when it comes to Shabbat, only two, three restrictions are mentioned in the Torah. One, an overarching, we should have a day of rest, but the Torah doesn't describe what that day of rest should be. It says don't do any manner of work, but it doesn't describe or define what work is. Okay, so we refrain from work, and specifically the Torah gives two examples. Don't light a fire, don't kindle a fire on Shabbat, and don't gather wood on Shabbat. That's all. There is possibly a reference that you shouldn't walk more than 2,000 cubits outside of the town. Okay, and that we, we have a, just a, a reference, a, 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 um, a by the way reference to that with 2,000 cubits in, in, the book of, uh, in the book of Numbers. But be that as it may, as it may, Shabbat and all of the understandings of these laws, it's, it's unclear how specific the Torah meant these to be followed and what mechanism there would be in place in order to follow these laws. The mechanism would be, there would be judges outside of the city gate who would handle cases as they would be brought forward to, the, to these judges. But again, the description how this mechanism was supposed to work is left vague, okay? So for 2000 years, we have our understanding that people worship God by bringing sacrifices or watching the sacrificial service in action, either in the Mishkan or later in the temple in Jerusalem. 2000 years ago, roughly, um, the temple was destroyed by the Romans. And that could have ended Judaism as we know it, right? Or the Israelite people as we know it. But the rabbis as an institution were uh, developing within the community a system that would work independent of the temple in Jerusalem but if the temple was, was standing, it would work in tandem with the temple. It just so happened that the temple was destroyed so that the system works independent of the temple in Jerusalem. And that system is the system of Judaism as we know today. The Israelite community was transformed into the Jewish community as defined by the rabbis. And the, the raison d'etre of the rabbis was to develop a system that would enable Judaism to be worshipped, to be observed, to be followed without a temple in Jerusalem. So that the system itself becomes the focus of what it means to be Jewish, as opposed to the temple defining what it means to be Jewish. Right? So what I mean by that is people looked forward three times a year to, to the pilgrimage festivals to meet one another again, to reunite and to worship God in the temple. And then they would go back home and observe or be Israelite in whatever way they were at home. And then their religious life was centered on those three times a year to travel to the temple. Whereas the rabbis created a system to be Jewish every day of the year. We don't need to wait to go to the temple to observe Shabbat or the holiday. You have a synagogue to observe it in. You have a home to observe it in. Okay, so it's the rabbis who develop this intricate detailed system to, uh, to define for us what work on Shabbat is, what types of work are permitted, what types of work are forbidden. And I'm, I'm focusing just on Shabbat 
because I'm eventually getting to the idea of Zooming on Shabbat and why it's even a Jewish issue, why we care and what the intricacies are associated with it. So again, Shabbat as defined by the Torah is a day of rest from work, which the rabbi, which the Torah gives two examples, kindling a fire and gathering wood as two examples of work to refrain from on Shabbat, okay? The rabbis then define quite, uh, de uh, quite specifically what work is and then categorize work into 39 categories of work that then we are supposed to refrain from on Shabbat. Now, as I describe this, I understand that what the rabbis did was, well, let me say it this way. What the rabbis did could be seen either in a positive way or a negative way. And by that, I mean, some people look for direction on how to conduct their life, right? So we need to know what are the ethical and moral principles by which we conduct our lives every single day? How do we make decisions? What are the moral, ethical factors that go into making a decision? My wife and I just finished watching a, a show on Netflix, a three season show called Bonus Family. And it's about, it's from Sweden. So it's all in Swedish and watching it in English subtitles. It's about a, a couple who are divorced from their partners and marry each other and the extended family that's created in the process and the decisions that they make in, in navigating this bonus family, as it's called. And so I, I just thought of that in terms of moral, ethical decisions, because there's a, a decision that the couple makes in the third season about a pregnancy. So what are the moral and ethical factors that go into making such a choice? And, and compounded with that are the law of laws of the country in which you live. And there are also religious um, factors that go into making a decision as well. So ethical moral principles, law of the land in which you live, and religious factors as well. That's what we all look for, not well, all civilized human beings look for such guidance in conducting their affairs, right? There are evil people in the world. There are psychopaths. There are people who just don't want to be um, defined by convention like ethical moral principles. So they either act out in public or they uh, hide away from the community as an ascetic and or uh, either living in the backwoods of Alaska or in a monastery or some other place where they don't conduct, they don't have to deal with other people. They can live life however they live it. Most people are not like those outliers. Most people uh, subscribe to some kind of societal convention, which are ethical, moral, legal, and for some as well, religious principles that guide our lives. That's what the rabbis did 2000 years ago. They used the Torah as the foundation for creating ethical, moral, legal, religious principles for people to guide, to conduct their affairs. Now, I've, sa I've said that that could be a positive or a negative. Some people see that as a negative. All these restrictions that uh, hinder the, our freedom of movement and our life. But 
most people who subscribe to the system understand it as a positive, that um, they don't, they aren't restrictive of our behavior, but they define our behavior and in fact provide moments in which we can experience God in our lives. That is the ultimate reason for having such a system. The rabbis wanted to say, we don't need to wait three times a year to go to the temple in Jerusalem to have that experience of God's presence in your lives. Rather, you have moments every single day. The ideal is a hundred blessings a day, a hundred encounters, a hundred rituals, a hundred things that we can do, decisions that we make that ultimately are religious decisions and therefore moments in which we can have a spiritual encounter with God. That, so that's not just praying three times a day, the morning, afternoon, and evening service, but even other decisions that we make, the clothes that we wear, right? Because garments that we put on our bodies cannot uh, have wool and linen uh, mixed together in the garment. So just by what we wear, we're thinking about being Jewish. What we eat, we're thinking about being Jewish. The decisions that we make uh, during the day are ethical, moral, religious decisions. Those are all opportunities, as the rabbis see it, as they defined, created and defined Judaism for us, they are all opportunities for us to encounter God, okay? So specifically now, uh, eventually getting to our topic about zooming, zooming on Shabbat, we understand then Shabbat is really a, a major foundational element of what it means to be Jewish. You know, there's keeping kosher and there's observing Shabbat. So most Jews today, if you ask them, what are a couple of defining elements of being Jewish? Most people would say Shabbat and Kashrut as two of those defining elements. So Shabbat, that the, the system that the Torah, that we read about in the Torah, that serves as a basis for the three major uh, monotheistic religions of the Western world, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all those religions have Shabbat, the Sabbath, as a cornerstone of their religious identity. A different day of the week for each one of those religions, but nonetheless, it is a Sabbath day, uh, a day of rest. And so for the rabbis, this day of rest is, a, is an understanding of what we do on Shabbat that is different from the six other days of the week. How do we conduct our life on Shabbat differently than we do the other days of the week? And one, uh, one major element is the idea that we are resting on Shabbat, resting from creative activities. That one, one definition of work is doing something creative, okay? Something creative, that, it, that also makes a lasting impression, okay? So um, that would mean writing, for example, would be considered a work, a type of work that would be prohibited on Shabbat because when we write, whether with ink or with pencil, we are making a lasting impression. Now, the discussion about within rabbinic literature about Shabbat can become quite complicated and so complex that for the average Jew, it might seem either too impossible to, uh, to engage with or perhaps too off-putting that maybe if there are too many encounters such as that, that were so intricate and so off-putting that it might even convince people not to observe Shabbat at all. Let me give you an example. So if I'm talking about writing on Shabbat, not only is one not allowed to write on Shabbat, one, one is not allowed to erase on Shabbat, okay? So 
you you can't create you can't write on Shabbat you can't erase on Shabbat because when you write on Shabbat you're creating something that will last and when you erase you are um, taking something away in a permanent fashion as well so to get to the uh, how we take this to an extreme what about if someone celebrates a birthday on Shabbat and there is a birthday cake that is presented to the birthday boy or girl that has written on the icing, happy birthday, Jonah, okay? Are we allowed to cut the cake on Shabbat? The writing, because you're cutting into the writing. Is the writing meant as writing or is it meant as decoration? Okay, so this is just an example and there are people within the Jewish community who would say, if you're uh, celebrating a birthday on Shabbat, you shouldn't have any writing on the cake. You can have a fancy cake with decorations on it and icing and flowers and stuff like that. But if there's actually wording on the cake that says happy birthday or whatever it says, you shouldn't have that on Shabbat because you'd be erasing the words permanently on Shabbat. So this is an example. I won't make a, a value judgment about that segment of the community that thinks uh, icing on a cake is writing. I actually personally don't think it's writing. It's meant to be a decoration. And therefore I have um, hungrily uh, cut into such a birthday cake uh, on Shabbat and have encouraged my family to do so as well. And when we've had the birthday cakes for Shabbat dinners in the past, I have happily cut into the happy birthday on those sheet cakes uh, on Shabbat. But I only bring this as an example of how, um, of how um, seriously some segments in the Jewish community take Jewish law um, and um, how it can be seen by some as ridiculous and by others as quite serious in terms of how we should know how to celebrate on, uh, celebrate on Shabbat. Okay, so with that being said, now let's get to the idea of Zooming on Shabbat and what technology has to do with Shabbat at all. Okay, so again, if we're understanding the, the whole system of halakha, the system of Jewish law, as the creation of the rabbis 2,000 years ago, and as it has been developed for the past 2,000 years and continues to be developed uh, in such a way as this paper that was just published two weeks ago is an example of how halakha, Jewish law, continues to be interpreted and developed within the conservative movement officially with its com committee on Jewish law and standards and by other rabbis in the Jewish community who take halacha seriously, okay? So this is an ongoing uh, dynamic process within Judaism, the system of Jewish law, okay? The, when it comes to um, technology on Shabbat, there are a couple of factors related to it that are important. One is uh, the question of the use of electricity on Shabbat, because technology today, what we're talking about, are all electronic in some way, whether they are battery operated or whether they are uh, plug-in operated, okay? So we're talking about the use of an electronic item that has to be turned on in some way, right? It's not always on. There are people who leave their computers on all the time, but most of the time our computers, whether they are Macs or PCs, whether they, whether they run the Mac operating system or the PC operating system of Windows, whether we leave the computer on or not, our computer goes to sleep. Okay, after a certain amount of time. Now you can arrange for your computer. You can go in manually into your system and tell your computer not to go to sleep, but the computer goes to sleep in order to save power. Okay, um, so uh, when 
so for example, if I were to close my laptop right now and then open it right again, uh, it's possible that it would uh, my computer automatically goes to sleep at that point. And if I lift the laptop, I'd have to get back into, uh, into the computer and then onto Zoom again. Okay, we all understand what I'm talking about then. With technology uh, is uh, electronic uh, in some way. And I, I am not being scientific about it, it's just easier to call it electronic whether it's a battery operated, whether that's considered electronic or not. But you get my point. The question is, can electricity be used on Shabbat? And that was a question that was raised 50 years ago by, or 60 years ago by the law committee of the conservative movement, uh, whether um, one could, for the simple question of whether one can turn on lights on Shabbat, does flipping the switch violate uh, flipping a wall switch to turn on lights in the room? Does that violate Shabbat in any way? Now, again, for the uninitiated, how can flipping a switch be considered work, right? And, and again, for the uninitiated, what work is, work seems to, would seem to be physical labor. So how is writing with a pen physical labor? It's not Again, for the rabbis, work is some creative activity, making something that hadn't been there before that will be permanent. So you're, when you flip the switch on the wall to turn on the lights, you are creating a circuit that hadn't been completed before. Is that considered work? Okay. In the greater scheme of things, this is an important question for the rabbis because the electricity because electricity is a new topic relative to the rabbis of 1500 years in the, 1500 years ago in the Talmud who had no concept of electricity or no imagination that something like electricity would ever come to into being for them that what the question then for us with this new a creation, this new invention of electricity, how do you categorize the new thing based on categories that are there before? Okay, so if you get what I'm saying, how, how do we understand electricity in light of what was there before in the halachic system? So electricity sometimes is used for light, well, what was light before in the time of the rabbis? Well, that was fire. So kindling a fire involved work. Now, that to start the, the original, the, the, to make the original fire required work of, you know, rubbing st uh, sticks together to create friction and enough heat to uh, get kindling to light. Uh, and then you have pieces of wood uh, and um, firewood that are then uh, make a raging fire in your stove or in your fireplace. And then maybe transferring fire from that to a smaller fire might not be work, but it's still transferring fire. So for the rabbis, one element of electricity is fire. So perhaps there are those in the Jewish community today who will not use lights on Shabbat because lights are serve the same purpose as fire. And just as you can't light a fire, you shouldn't turn on a light. That's one easy argument that many in the Orthodox community use today for the use of fire, for use of electricity on Shabbat. Others, like those in the conservative movement, try to understand the science behind the electronics itself and what's going on behind, behind the wall when a switch is flipped, what's it doing to the, to the electric current and understanding that really work is not really work when flipping a switch. You're just making a new um, connection in the wires that are already there. So there are many within a conservative movement, myself included, who will flip a switch on Shabbat. But 
who won't flip a switch on their dishwasher. My dishwasher is electronic. Flipping a switch on it makes the dishwasher turn on and do work. So for me, I understand the use of, 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 elect, of electronic devices is all about the what the device is doing on Shabbat. So my oven is electric. What one is not allowed to cook on Shabbat. That's just a general statement. So even with an electronic oven, one is not allowed to cook on Shabbat. But I, so I leave my electric oven on all of Shabbat on a low temperature in order to warm my food on Shabbat. But I will not turn off my oven on Shabbat when I'm done eating on Shabbat. Even though it is electric and I'm just flipping a switch, the oven whose purpose was to cook and do work, I will not turn it off or on on Shabbat. The same with the dishwasher. Even though I'm touching a button, it's doing work and I will not turn the dishwasher on on Shabbat. So devices like that, I, even though they're electronic, I will not use on Shabbat. The lights, whether opening the refrigerator door when a light turns on, I will not, I will use on Shabbat. And other lights in my house, I will turn off and on on Shabbat. Uh, and many within the conservative movement do the same. The, the more intricate discussion now is in the age of computers and smartphones and Kindles or other electronic digital books. What about the use of those devices on Shabbat? The other element of, of Shabbat that relates here is a sense of oneg Shabbat, delighting or having joy on Shabbat. Now we think of an oneg Shabbat as kind of like a kiddush, the food served after Friday night services or Shabbat morning services, that could be called an oneg Shabbat. But oneg really is delighting in Shabbat. Things that we do on Shabbat that are a delight, like spending time to study Torah, spending time with family, taking a walk through nature, uh, spending time at the beach, things like the reading, things like these are oneg Shabbat. Taking a nap during the day on Shabbat, that's oneg Shabbat. Um, so if reading is oneg Shabbat, can you read a Kindle or some other electronic digital ebook on Shabbat. So I do read my Kindle on Shabbat. Even before COVID, I do read books on my Kindle on Shabbat. The question that people have about doing such a thing on Shabbat are the distractions that could possibly come to play in those digital books. Because on my Kindle, it is connected to Wi-Fi. If I wanted to, I could connect to the internet through Google Chrome or Safari or Firefox, whatever Edge, Microsoft Edge, whatever your internet browser is, you can do that on your Kindle. Uh, I don't do that on my Kindle. So I, be sh I am sure that I narrow the use of my Kindle to just be, to just read on Shabbat which is why before COVID, I didn't, I, don't, I didn't use my laptop on Shabbat. Using my computer on Shabbat to where I usually read email, I read the news on the internet, I uh, go to Amazon and purchase things. These are things I use my laptop for. Those are all considered work. Now, some might say shopping could be oneg, could be delight. Some people enjoy shopping um, so that shopping would be a delight on Shabbat. But there are aspects of shopping 
that are just inappropriate on Shabbat. Not supposed to spend money on Shabbat. Um, you're not, uh, and right, and you could argue, well, I'm not really spending the money right away. Amazon knows my credit card, so I can make that purchase and it really doesn't get, uh, my credit card doesn't see that purchase really authorizing it maybe until 12 hours later, which could be after Shabbat is over. So I haven't really bought anything on Shabbat. But th these are all extensions of the idea that really you shouldn't, you're, it's a slippery slope and you really shouldn't be on the computer on Shabbat, let alone on Amazon or eBay or some other site like that on Shabbat. Okay, so with all of that background now about what halacha is, what the system of the, the, that the rabbis created, what Shabbat is, what work is, what electricity is related to Shabbat, what computers are related to Shabbat, what corollary activities coming from the use of electricity or digital equipment on Shabbat, now we can enter the discussion about Zooming and live streaming on Shabbat, okay? So I kind of figured it would take 37 minutes of background on this to get to, to this topic, but it's, it just goes to show how intricate and um, the, the whole halachic system is. And again, can be seen as positive, can be seen as negative. I see it in a positive light. But I'm, I, I always try to explain it in a way so that people see the positive value of having, of subscribing to a halachic system as part of our understanding of what our Jewish lifestyle is. Okay, so now when the pandemic hit a year and a half ago, we as a congregation with every other synagogue in the world had to figure out how we're gonna keep the community together, right? Because with lockdowns in effect, people not being allowed to leave their homes, how are we and not be, a, be allowed to, to gather together inside or outside for quite some time during a lockdown, how are, how are synagogues or any religious community going to survive? Because community went against the definition of lockdown. When you're in lockdown, you're isolated, you're alone. Community means a group of people together, which went against the, um, the, the guidelines that were put in place by Montgomery County, Maryland, and every other Jewish jurisdiction across the country a year and a half ago. So the way to pivot uh, in order to keep the community together was the live streaming, which we did for a couple of months, and then uh, Zoom even more uh, intimately, right? So we had the technology in place with a camera in back of the sanctuary for uh, which uh, was connected then to our YouTube channel. So we were streaming through YouTube. There are, are a variety of ways to stream, that is to broadcast onto the internet through such a program. We stream through YouTube because it's free. Um, so we had the mechanism in place <coughs> to set the streaming on a timer so that it would be set before Shabbat to turn on on Shabbat morning and start streaming to YouTube automatically and then stop automatically as well, okay? So that we wouldn't have to worry about getting onto the computer, turning on the computer, turning on the system and manually operating that system, which I really did not want to do before COVID. And Ira Kallmeister and Jeff Winkler found a way in order to do it so that we could be within these Shabbat guidelines. So before COVID, we were live streaming the service and we're doing that successfully. Five or six people watching the service every week because they just couldn't make it or even more people watching it, families of B'nai Mitzvah who just couldn't make it in to town to celebrate the bar or bat mitzvah with the family. Those, uh, and God forbid, when we had funerals as well, 
family members of a funeral uh, who couldn't make it to the service uh, were able to watch on the live stream. So since we had the system in place, we just went to that live streaming system. And then I realized that the system is impersonal as opposed to Zooming right now where we can see each other. Those of us on Zoom can see each other, can watch each other, see what we're doing. We can even chat to each other if we turned on the chat feature uh, that we we're more, we, we recreate community through Zoom. And I realized that we needed to do this as a community to stay together as a community. The religious committee agreed and therefore we found a way to Zoom from the synagogue. Well, even before that, to Zoom from my house and Zoom from Cantor Adina's house to conduct the Shabbat morning service that way. And as you know, we, we had between 40 and 50 people on an average Shabbat Zooming in. And that was beautiful. And we also uh, pivoted uh, our morning and evening minion on that way as well. Always had more than a minion on Zoom so that we could recreate community that way. The issues with Zoom now on COVID, which pre still prevented some conservative synagogues and all Orthodox synagogues from using Zoom on Shabbat, is back to the idea of using electronics on Shabbat and using the computer on Shabbat. That's issue number one, whether you can do that on Shabbat or not. I said before COVID, not. During COVID, I changed my mind because of a concept that Joshua Heller, Rabbi Joshua Heller, talked about in this teshuva, but even more so in the teshuva that he wrote two, three months into COVID a year ago. So just over a year ago, he wrote that one, Sha'at Hadachak, extenuating emergency cir circumstances provide an opportunity to uh, pivot and do something that would normally not be allowed to be done. So many people within the conservative movement said, okay, we will use electronics on Shabbat in order to get people to use Zoom and be on Zoom in that way. The other question behind this is whether we can be counted in a minion in this virtual kind of way. And that really is what Joshua Heller, Rabbi Joshua Heller and his teshuva spend some time with at the beginning of his teshuva. For the first 10 pages or so, he talks about that idea of what minion meant. What, what does it mean to be a quorum? Um, and where, how is the quorum constituted? And does everybody have to be in the same place when the quorum is constituted? So he, he goes through a number of sources that says, if somebody, if somebody is in, if we have a group of people on one side of a courtyard and another group of people on another side of the courtyard, they're not actually together under the same roof because if you can picture a courtyard, just picture your laptop, your iPad, whatever you're looking at to watch this today. Uh, picture your laptop as the area of the courtyard and picture homes on, all around the courtyard, okay? That's how, um, that's how uh, homes and villages were arranged in the Middle East 1500 years ago. Um, so can people who are in one home on one side of the courtyard, who can see their neighbors through the window on the other side of the courtyard, can they combine together as a minion? The, the answer is, depends. If they can hear each other, if they can see each other, then yes. If they cannot see, hear each other, no. If they cannot see each other, but they can hear each other, it depends. So there is, a, there is a source that says if you're not in the same room, but as long as you can see each other, then you can have such a combined group of people form a minion in that way. Clearly, the rabbis had no sense of virtually see, seeing each other 
as we do on Zoom. So the, the, there was Rabbi Reisner about 20 years ago, wrote a teshuva about uh, whether someone who is live streaming or phoning in to a minion, can that person be counted in a minion? Right, so we, let's say we have a group of people in our Grossberg Baumgart Chapel, we got nine people, and we have one person watching on live stream or one person phoning in. When they're watching on live stream, we have, we, the people in the chapel, have no idea that somebody is watching or how many people are watching. So the question is, can you count that person towards a minion? And Reisner's answer was a definitive no, because that person can't be seen whether they're phoning in or, or, uh, or uh, connecting through live stream, they're not being seen by the people in the chapel and they can't constitute a minion, but the person phoning in or watching the live stream can fulfill their, their responsibility or their obligation to say Kaddish. If there's a minion in place where the minion is happening and they say Kaddish, as the minion is saying Kaddish. So a person live streaming or phoning in can be number 11 in the minion of 10, but they can't be one through 10 in the minion. So that question is applied now during COVID. And as we are slowly exiting COVID, but we're not quite there yet, can we have such a thing as a hybrid minion? Or even before, can we have a minion on Zoom? Clearly, no, not clearly. Rabbi Joshua Heller wrote for Sha'at HaDachak, for this emergency extenuating circumstance, circumstance time, absolutely, you can constitute a minion on Zoom. And that's what we did. We absolutely did that. I personally said, now, there are some who said they read Torah on Zoom. I did not do that. I felt personally that reading Torah requires being in person to do that. So even if I had a Torah handy at my house and opened the Torah, I could not call people to, a, to, to have an aliyah. I could not... Um, uh, read the Torah that way for people because we were not at the Torah. So we all agreed with the religious committee that we would not take the Torah out of the ark, even when we went back into the sanctuary to hold bar and bat mitzvah services on Shabbat. We did not take the Torah out of the ark for that kind of service uh, that we were doing on Zoom. Okay, so that's, that's something I did differently. Um, everything else, though, about the service remained the same. We did everything that we would normally do in a minion on services, on Zoom, on Shabbat. Other people, other people within the conservative movement decided that they would say Kaddish on Zoom and they would conduct the service on Zoom on Shabbat, but they would not do other parts of the service that could only be done with a minion um, that could only be done with a minion. So what, to say the baruchu, as, uh, as you start the morning service or the evening service, uh, to do the kedusha, start the amida out loud, there are some synagogues that did not do that on Zoom. Even though they had a minion present, they said it's not a real minion in person, and therefore they did not do that. I said it was okay to do those, things, and we did do those things um, on Zoom. Now that we are back in person for services, the question is, what can you do post uh, these restrictions as you uh, open up and have in-person services again? And that's where Rabbi Heller offers at the end of his paper, it's a 50-page paper, three options going forward as we go through um, uh, in person. So option one, he says on page 50, some may not find the arguments for virtual minion sufficiently convincing to apply to most prayers and activities that require a minion. 
Uh, but given the specific attributes and leniencies of Mourner's Kaddish, one may justify its recitation in a virtually constituted quorum. So in other words, option number one, go back to Zoom being uh, just um, uh, for number 11 on, but well, uh, we can say Kaddish over Zoom. And that had a resounding 18 people voting in favor of it and three people opposed. So that option is an option. Option number two, if a community already uses other loopholes to constitute a minion of 10, when only nine Jewish adults are present in person, uh, for example, counting a minor who is old enough to be an intentional participant as the 10th, which we have done, counting a child to make a minion. I've done that before. So if a community already uses such a loophole, then they can use other loopholes. Then the virtual minion approach may be used in the same way, meaning that if nine adults are present in person, a virtual participant can be counted as the 10th only. Okay, so you wanna have nine in person. If you're desperate, you can have the 10th on Zoom. And that also had 11 in favor and seven opposed. The option which we do now, if this is option three, if there is a minion present through virtual means or a hybrid group, with part of a minion in common location, in a common location, and others joining via live video, then as long as there is a real-time video and audio link such that at least 10 adult Jews can be seen by each other and can see and hear the leader, then any rituals for which a minion might be required may and should be performed. The full Torah service is included, but requires special care. Okay, this is what we do at Sharei Tefillah. And this is the only way that we can have a minion going forward, right? When we, once we went in person for morning minion, the only way we have been able to make a minion is this option, option number three. This morning, for example, we had seven people in, this, in the chapel, not a minion. That's among, and yesterday, Sunday, also, I think we had six or seven people in the chapel. We have never had a minion of people. We've never had 10 people since we opened up in June in person in the chapel. The only way we have been able to make a minion is because on Sundays, we get six other people to join by Zoom. This morning, we had four, uh, four people, I think, five people joining us on Zoom, right? So those five plus the six or seven in the chapel, we had a minion. And reading Torah, this is the way we do it as well. I take the Torah out of the ark. We have reread Torah uh, from the Bima. So this is what I do. The person leading the service has to be in person. That not, not necessarily according to option three, is that a requirement? Somebody on Zoom can lead the service. I prefer that somebody be in person when we have an in-person service that the in, somebody in person is leading the service. That's what I say, and that's how we do it. And we read Torah from the Torah that's in the chapel. But I will call up people to, for an aliyah, like uh, Barbara has done this. She's been levy uh, uh, many, several times uh, since June uh, at our, in, at, at our uh, morning minion. So that um, either, there have been times when all three people getting an aliyah on a, on a Monday or a Thursday morning have been those people on Zoom. And usually we mix it up. So this morning, for example, um, Marlene Sandberg had a yard site for her mother. So she had the Levy aliyah. Alan Wright, who's a Monday regular, was in person. He had the third aliyah. And Ron Miller, who was on Zoom, had the second aliyah. So that's how we did it. I angle the uh, camera in such a way so the camera is pointing to the open Torah and the person on Zoom sees the Torah there. It's not the same as being as holding the Torah itself. That's the optimum way to do it. When you have an aliyah to be in person at the Torah holding on to the Torah, but this is second best. This option, option three, that Rabbi Heller wrote about in his paper, had nine votes in favor and nine votes against. Nine votes in favor was still enough to make this a viable option for all rabbis and to make it an acceptable opinion of the law committee. 
this is the opinion that we follow and I am happy to do this. And it's actually, I'm not just happy to do it. I'm glad this option is here because this is the only way that we're able to make a minion. On Shabbat morning, for example, uh, we often for the past couple of weeks have not had a minion of people present in person in order to start the service. So I've had to count people on Zoom in order to start the service right away with Shochenad and then going into the Chatzikadosh. Chatzikadosh, you need a minion for in order to recite. So this is, but on Shabbat, since we have more than a minion present by the time we have Torah, the Torah reading, I only will have those people who are present have an honor. I, I, I will not call people on Zoom to have an honor that way on Shabbat. So this is the way that I, as the rabbi of Sharei Tefillah, play with the, uh, the, uh, the Zoom um, specifics in order to make it work for us. And every rabbi in their congregation has the option with their religious committee to come up with a, with a plan that makes sense for their congregation too. So I, I use the word playing with, and I don't mean to uh, denigrate the system at all, to say that it's a game. It's a, far from the, far be it for me to say that, and I don't want to be understood as saying it that way. It could be understood as heresy or blasphemy on my part. This is not a game. The, the halachic system is not a game. It's a matter of trying to seriously encounter the laws of, of Judaism as defined by the rabbis, as understanding these laws as God's commands, right? That's how the rabbis understood it, that these are commands from the rabbi, from God on how we should conduct our life. And when we are fulfilling the command, we are listening to God, we are obeying the command. The obeying, the listening to the command is makes it a two-way action, an interaction with God. God spoke, God commanded, we have the halachic system as God's command, and when we observe the system, we are listening, obeying to God, so it becomes an interaction, a live interaction. And so I take this very, very seriously and understand that this is a way that... Um, and Rabbi Heller refers to this in, in, in the paper as well. The idea of minion is being able, asuli mikdash v'shachanti betocham. Make for me a sanctuary, God says, so that I can dwell among them, that is, among the people of Israel. So when we come together, when we intentionally form a prayer group, a group of people come together to daven, to study. We are intentionally creating sacred space and bringing God into that space. And so when we have, when we have that space, incorporating Zoom into that space, incorporating the live stream into that space, we are only further sanctifying that space, making it sacred and holy. And I think that's how I understand Zoom on Shabbat. That's how I understand us moving forward. Anything that, that can enhance community, can, can um, further emphasize that our community is sacred, then that brings God into the community, and that's how we can do it. Right on the dot of noon. So any questions on Barbara or Jules before we uh, call it a day? Barbara. Um, this goes back to the very beginning. Yes. Um, when you mentioned that the uh, rabbis uh, talked about instead of temple, synagogue. Yes. The synagogue in, in itself was, how was that word derived? It was that. Oh, it's a Greek word. Um, and, um, how it entered the English language, I don't know, but it's the translation of the Hebrew, Beit Knesset. And there are actually three words for where people would gather to pray or to study. It's either the Beit Knesset, the house of assembly, that's what synagogue means in Greek, 
uh, or Beit Midrash, which, uh, which would be school or house of study, or Beit Tefillah, house of prayer. Okay, so those three different words are all incorporated into what a synagogue is. And the synagogue itself, the rabbis created it. Some think it even goes back to the time of the Babylonian exile. That's 586 BCE. What did the Jews do, the Israelites do while they were in exile in Babylonia? Some scholars suggest that the institution of the synagogue was created in its initial forms back in Babylonia 2,500 years ago. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. All right, so have a good day. Uh, we'll meet again next Monday and we'll start talking about the uh, high holiday season as we journey through the Jewish year. Take care. You too.